and welcome to our show, The Crossover, a show aimed at bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. Today we have a special guest on our show, Dr. William Bean, and we're going to be discussing the 20th century's most important archaeological find, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because Dr. Bean is a professor and a pastor and a Bible teacher, he's going to focus on the effect of the Dead Sea Scrolls on the New Testament. These Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest copies of the Bible yet known to man. They are more than a thousand years older than any others now in existence. Dr. William Bean is a Dead Sea Scrolls advisor and an executive director of the Center of the Study of Biblical Research in Redlands, California. He has been leading tours to Israel for more than 30 years and he is one of only a few people to interview the shepherd boy who discovered these scrolls in the caves of Qumran by the Dead Sea. Dr. William Bean has spent a lifetime as a pastor, educator, and Bible teacher, and he has been intensely interested in the Hebraic background to the New Testament, and has recently authored the book, New Treasures, a perspective of the New Testament teachings through Hebraic eyes. He also writes for Illustrated Bible Life and Restore Magazines. A credentialed teacher, he lectures at the college and seminary level in the United States and Israel. Here's Dr. Bean and Mitch. Enjoy. Dr. Bean, welcome to the crossover Thank you again. Very much. Glad to have you on our show. Again, the crossover is a show bridging gaps between the Jews and Christians. And just to start us off, what, uh, your, your, your life is very diversified here in different arenas, but what are you doing uh, to help bridge that gap? Well, we're working throughout the country. Uh, one, basically, for people to understand who are Christians, more of the mother faith from which Christianity came. At Greenville College, Greenville, Illinois, we have a program of Judaic Christian Studies uh, sponsored by the Shapiro Foundation, a Jewish organization. And in California, uh, we have a graduate program for pastors. Uh, these pastors are studying each week. Uh, presently, we just finished the first semester with 20 pastors that represent 18,000 people. Well, these pastors are beginning to make uh, testimonies like, I have to re-examine my own faith. I have to begin looking into the scriptures in a deeper relationship with the Jewish faith uh, to have a greater understanding. So anything to break down the walls of anti-Semitism is very important to us because we do have a relationship. Absolutely. And we have this, share the same God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, right. and Jacob. Well, Dr. Bean, to, to uh, share here again on the scrolls, we've done one segment with you before, but for viewers maybe that didn't see that, um, just bring us back to what are the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, their discovery, their importance in, in, in today's uh, world? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest document we had of the Old Testament, we call the Old Testament, which is the First Testament, was the Masoretic Text and the oldest copy dated back to 1008 AD or CE, the uh, common era. And before that, uh, there was nothing earlier. And now we are catapulted, as I mentioned before, back to 1200 years earlier to where we have documents, 90% of the Bible in Hebrew that we uh, can use to verify the validity of even uh, the First Testament. Wow. Well, that's, that's phenomenal. And from that, what this show is going to do is we want to show the effects that your, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls have had onto the Second Testament or the New Testament, as Christians would call it today. Because most of the, de in fact, all of the Dead Sea Scrolls were Old Testament or First Testament discoveries. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna, you wrote a whole book here called New Treasures. And you must have a lot to say here because you're, what you're about to share with us is how they've affected the New Testament, which if I heard you say earlier, there aren't any um, documents from the New Testament that were discovered uh, back in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Ab absolutely. However, uh, one of our uh, earliest Bibles from Mount Sinai uh, does have the New Testament. It dates back to about the fourth century, and we have a few codices that have the New Testament. However, what we try to do at the Center for the Study of Biblical Research, uh, one of the other irons in, in the fire that I have, besides uh, working with the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation, is New Testament research. But we try to be very, uh, what we call in, in Christianity, uh, cultural-centric, language-centric, 
Jesus-centric. Let's go back to the period of time and study uh, from that period of time what language did these pe people speak, what were their cultures, what were their customs, and what were their idiomatic phrases. This would be interesting. Yeah. Why don't you start us with the cover here, because your cover is uh, interesting in itself. What language is this and what is this that we're looking at? This is the Bar Kokhba letter. This dates back to the Bar Kokhba revolt in 1936, 1937. It's an interesting find because this is a general letter written in Ivrit, in Hebrew. And not in Aramaic, not in Greek, but in Hebrew. And what's interesting about this particular statement is it has what we call a colloquialism or slang. Uh, we say in English, how you doing? Not how are you doing or excuse me, not excuse me. Uh, young people come up with these colloquials. Even in Israel today, to say goodbye to someone in Hebrew, you'd say, lehitrot. Well, the young people would just say, trot, you know, bye. And now they say, bye-bye. That's actually Hebrew. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, the Bar Kokhba letter, if uh, I might open this book, uh, has... Now, this teach, just tell our people for a second who Bar Kokhba was. Oh, Bar Kokhba was the leader of the Second Jewish Revolt uh, after the temple was destroyed in about 136 A.D. And Rabbi Akiva, the great rabbi, claimed that Bar Kokhba but uh, his name is really Bar Kosba. We found that on this, on this, uh, in this letter. Uh, Bar Kokhba was claimed, or he acknowledged that he was the Messiah. So everyone was going to follow him, except for the believers in Jesus that went to Petra. Now, in this letter, we find this, this colloquialism. It actually reads, Shalom me'id ani elai tashmaim. In English, it's peace, shalom. I take heaven, and then it goes as my witness against me. But what's interesting is this third line, Shalom me'id ani alai tashmaim. Uh, originally, it should read Shalom me'id ani alai et hashamayim. But what Bar Kokhba did, he dropped the aleph and the he out, moved the tet over, and performed a colloquialism, as we would say in English, to heavens. Not the heavens, to heavens. Now the important thing about this discovery is that you, you, it would be unable for you to write this, a colloquial or slang, unless you have a spoken language. So it shows us that even back in 132, there was more Hebrew spoken than what we realized. Mm -hmm. and that's a very important discovery for us. As I said before, yes, Jesus spoke Aramaic, uh, Jesus spoke Hebrew, probably Greek, probably New Latin. But um, I think that he taught basically a lot in the Hebrew language. That's the important thing. Aramaic and Hebrew. So from a Hebrew language, it would be a slang, and right. it, in other words, it would be, uh -huh. that's what you're getting that's at correct. here. Hebrew and Aramaic are like Portuguese and Spanish. If you know one, you sort of know the other a little bit, not much. And th today, the Hebrew you have today, the block letters are actually Aramaic letters to begin with. Okay. And part of our, what we call the Old Testament, a part of the Tanakh, Daniel chapter 7, is written completely in Aramaic. So did Hebrew come from Aramaic, Aramaic from Hebrew, or? Uh, it all derives from what we call a Semitic language of that time. It, it goes way back. Aramaic is one of the most ancient languages. Uh, dates way back and. Uh, we can almost go all the way back to Abraham with uh, some type of Semitic language. So, when we can now go back to like the Hebrew mm -hmm. and, and like, like Isaiah, the scrolls here, and now not have to ha go through a layer of translation through Greek, but go back to the original source, we're going to be picking up different idioms or phrases or, right. or expressions that will pr uh, have brought new life to the scriptures, which we would have missed before. And, and if, I'm, if I remember, you, you've been a pastor for 20, how many years? 28 years. So there, are there any examples here of when you were pastoring, teaching on a topic like many pastors maybe do, and then all of a sudden after this discovery saying, whoa, that wasn't as accurate as I had hoped. And here, now it's coming more to light. Any examples like that? Have, have you ever heard someone say, if it's not in the Bible, I don't want to know about it? I'm um, sure I have. <laughs> but if we could find something outside the Bible that would tell us and explain an idiom, 
I'd sure want to know about it. And an example is uh, Jesus said, if your eye is good or if your eye is bad. A good eye, ayin tova, a bad eye, ayin ra'a. They're mentioned in the Tanakh, but uh, they're not interpreted. It actually means if your eye is good, tov, or if your eye is stingy. Uh, basically, even today in modern Hebrew, they say in Israel, this is going to be the week of the National Cancer Drive of Israel. Have a good eye. Be generous. However, we take it back further than that. We go back to the intertestamental period, uh, the pseudepigrapha, for example, the, the unknown authors. And in the uh, book of uh, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, in the Testament of Benjamin and Issachar, we find the following in regard to this idiomatic phrase of good eye. It basically states there, if your eye is single. Now, the word good is not even in the original Greek eclectic text, so we know it's not good. Even though that's used today, it, it's partially correct, generosity, if your eye is generous. However, it says, and translated it into English, it says, uh, let your eye be single. Uh, for example, it tells us that two eyes represent Satan. It is of Satan. In other words, don't say represents Satan himself, Hasatan, uh -huh. uh, the devil. Yeah. In other words, don't say one thing here and say something over here, or don't hear one thing here, or hear something over here. But the single eye is the inner disposition of the individual. It's your inner self. So basically, it's an idiomatic phrase. How would you translate into Spanish, for example, it's raining cats and dogs. Literally, if you translated it, they'd go outside and look for the cats and dogs coming down. Well, this is what we're able to do. We're able to take these idiomatic phrases and find them and what Jesus meant by them. And Jesus was saying, if your inner disposition is good, your whole body will be filled with this. No, hold on. Another look. So you, this was found in, this, in the scrolls, even though it wasn't interpreted at that level, but the, the well, eye, the single eye. They're not they, scrolls. The, parts of them were found at Qumran, mm -hmm. but it, it was a, a, a scrolls that were written during the intertestamental period. Mm -hmm. okay. But if you are a, a Saturnine individual, I mean evil disposition, then your whole body will be full of that. And that makes more sense to me than just, I always wondered when I was a young pastor, which eye? Yeah. If your eye is good right. or if your eye is bad. Mm. And James speaks of double-mindedness. Double exactly. mm -hmm. And this is Matthew 6, 22 that, right. uh, that right. Dr. Bean is mentioning here. Right. We're going to cut away for a second. We're going to come back to Dr. Bean and take us through some other uh, uh, phrases, expressions that will m bring more meaning to us. But we just want our viewers to take a second and look at some other shows that we have for the crossover that uh, we want you to, to view here for the next minute. back to the crossover and we're with uh, Dr. Bean and we're uh, talking on his book here, The New Treasures and Perspective of the New Testament Teachings Through Hebraic Eyes. And um, Dr. Bean, sometimes the Pharisees sort of get knocked a lot and condemned a lot. And um, is there any misunderstanding or cultural misunderstanding maybe through the ages that uh, would change that? Yes, there were, I was trying to find it here in the book, uh, there were seven orders of the Pharisees in the days of Jesus. Uh, Jesus um, basically, even in his teachings, used a hermeneutical study of Rabbi Hillel. There are seven midot of Rabbi Hillel. But also and what does that mean to our viewers? Uh, herm it's a way of interpretation, like when Jesus uses the phrase, how much more. Okay. Uh, this is a hermeneutical interpretation that the Jewish people used. There were seven orders of the Pharisees. And these names were given to them by outsiders. 
like the Hebrew name Ivri, Ivrit was given by outsiders. The Christian name Christian was given by outsiders, and outsiders gave these names. There was one Pharisee called the Bloody Nose Pharisee. Uh, this Pharisee was worried that he might look upon a woman, so he always walked with his head down. He was so pious, but he would run into a post or run into a wall, and uh, they called him the Bloody Nose Pharisee. There is, but there was also called the Shoulder Pharisee, and in Matthew 23, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. This was the Shoulder Pharisee, in Hebrew, Shoulder Shechem, or the village of Shechem, that's where they originated from means those Pharisees that place their burdens upon other people's shoulders. So basically all of Matthew 23 is against this one particular Pharisee. Uh, you know, they were basically outside they looked like whited sepulchers, but inside they were old dry bones. But we have to also realize there were people like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And these were probably the God-loving Pharisee. That's another order of Pharisee. There was the, the ever-reckoning Pharisee, or wait a little Pharisee, the shoulder Pharisee, the bleeding Pharisee, the fearful Pharisee. Uh, and, and also what a lot of people don't realize is during the days of Jesus, there, was order, there were two schools of thought. There was the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. So what we try to do in our work is acquaint pastors, especially, and laity, in the background from whence the New Testament came. And with that, let's look at um Let's go back here to Psalm 22 as right. a, as a yeah. very strong example. We really, viewers really listen to this because this is a very well-known psalm in churches and, and, and uh, King David, uh, I believe, is the author here. And this goes back about a thousand years, I believe, before Jesus was on the earth. Yeah, and this is a psalm that, uh, for people who don't know, um, really talks about his crucifixion. That's now, but a lot of the rabbinical uh, Jewish rabbis do not seem to hold that view here and, and why don't you share with us what you've learned from from the um, uh, the scrolls that have been discovered and studied and how do they now um, bring to light Psalm 22 and, and, and like you've been showing us before uh, I, I feel that Jesus preached one of the greatest sermons from the cross he used a form of what we call remes which means to allude or refer back to make an inference back to a uh, particular passage. He did this all through his teaching, and when he said Eli, Eli, lama shabak, or Azabnati is the way it is in uh, Psalm 22 in Ivrit, uh, he was just alluding the people back to this total psalm. Now, is uh, that the first line that you were just yes, reading? And uh, my God, my God, why my have God. you forsaken me? Right. Um, and that language you just said it was, was in Hebrew. Okay. Uh, if it had been in Aramaic, it would be Eloi, Eloi, and uh, in Aramaic that only means uh, God, does not mean Eliyahu, Elijah. So we feel that possibly he was at the cross, was speaking Hebrew. But I'm not an advocate of that. However, in Psalm 22, verse 16, and in verse 17 in the Masoretic text, there has been uh, a debate over whether this is Ka'ari or Ka'ari or Ka'aru or Ka'aru, Ka'ari or Ka'aru. The same root word in both, but Ka, Ka'ari actually means Ka like Ari lion. Ka'aru actually is a verb, it's a hiffel verb, it means to dig into. And the difference between the three consonants is the last consonant. Is it a yud? You know, a yud is a very small letter, or is it a vav? Okay, and isn't a yud the smallest letter, Hebrew letter? The smallest in the Hebrew alphabet. Yeah. And so, does it mean, a matter of fact, you can open up an interlinear Bible with Hebrew and Greek that we use in Christianity. And it has English in Hebrew and Greek in English. And it says, ke'ari, like a lion in Hebrew, but underneath it says pierce. It's really misleading so, to Christian ministers. Okay. Yes. So, um, what is it? Well, the Septuagint says that my hands are pierced. But again, when we look at the, uh, the form here, people don't trust uh, this version or the ancient versions that come forth or from so forth. So, um, there's been a, a debate uh, between Christianity and Judaism. I don't want to go into that, but I usually go with text, how the text is read. Uh, 
I don't think it takes away from either faith. I, I just think that we need to understand a little bit more about this. Now, at... Uh, Should we read the text for our viewers yeah, here so the they can hear what we're talking about, about right? right? This is an extremely well-known verse. This is Psalm 22, uh, verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Mm -hmm. And then the next verse, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. That's correct. So the controversy here is that word pierced, if mm -hmm. I'm understanding you correctly. That's, that's right. some of the rabbinic, uh, the rabbis are saying, well, it doesn't mean pierced, it means lion. Mm -hmm. But the actual source, when you went back to the Hebrew here, you discovered was it means well, we pierced, or what was the other word you used? Uh, or to dug into, dug into. dig into. Uh, we discovered at uh, Nahal, which is wadi in Ar uh, Arabic, a wadi, Nahal in Hebrew, Nahal Hever, H-E-V-E-R, uh, Psalms, uh, it's listed as five. Uh, we found this particular fragment with Psalm 22. And if you look at it carefully, this is the only copy I, it took me six months. It, it's mentioned in our Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, but I had to write to Israel, and one of our scholars had to send it to me, and I just received it the other day. Uh, it was discovered just a, a few years ago, but this is Psalm 22, and if you look carefully here, uh, scholars have to look under a, a microscope, basically, to see this, but we have here Karu, the Aleph wasn't used. They didn't use the Aleph in that way, so you'll notice right here, this is a vav. It's not a yud. It's the full length of the resh. Karu yadai. Hands. So basically it reads karu. Well, if it's karu or karu, it means, again, it's a hiffle verb, and it means they have dug into and pierced. And you said this was a more recent discovery right, from this... Right. Uh, Meaning how many? Well, when we say recent, maybe within the last 10 years or so. So I think I read that you have 65 scholars that actually are able to get to these scrolls and, and study and do this an analytical research. And 65 just within the scholars were working on putting everything together, and they had a two-year period to put everything together. Right. And, uh, and this just surfaced recently. Oh, yes. What's happening with a lot of these fragments, first of all, is we were unable to read them, and now all of a sudden they're coming alive. And we're finding these different uh, uh, phrases and the exact wording and so forth like that. So, Dr. Bean, you think we can just rip out the middle page here, which separates the First Testament from the, old, from the Second Testament, and just call it one book? Well, we should call it one Bible. Uh, the Jewish people don't agree uh, with the Christian people that the New Testament is a canon Bible. However, when you say New Testament in Hebrew, it's berit hakadashah. It actually means a renewal of. And what it comes down to basically is this. We both believe in the same God. We both believe that there's a Messiah to come. They're, they're looking for a Messiah differently than Christianity is looking for a Messiah. But we have to look at the fact and have people realize that Christianity developed out of Judaism. And the beginnings of Christianity even started before Jesus came into the world. It started back in the intertestamental period where eschatology was being studied, end times. The Essenes, who were mm -hmm. Jewish, were studying a lot about end times. Really? And the New Testament writers, uh, Christianity is an eschatological uh, religion. So I think what has happened over the years is that the church has lost some of its contact from the culture and the language. And what we need to do is go back, not that we have to change or anything like that, but to understand more about where we came from. Well, what I sense you're doing, Dr. Bean, is bringing us more from analytical to relationship building with, right. with our God right. and bringing the, the, the religions together. Just like you said, there is only one God. Um, well, we unfortunately are uh, out of time, but we sure appreciate you bringing the actual, here's, a, here's that, the, the uh, scrolls and, uh, on the parchment and and uh, all the knowledge that you have, and uh, hopefully we've done enough justice that people will be able to pick your book up and, and really get into it in depth and, and get more, more knowledge. We appreciate you coming. Thank, Thank you, you for spending much. time. And now back to Rosalie.
We hope that you enjoyed today's program, and for those of you who would like more information about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can contact Dr. William Bean at www.csbr.net. We hope you'll tune into the crossover next week. Shalom. Let's go.